All right. Uh, again, um, it's John Livingston from Verve Industrial. Um, thank you all very, very much for joining us today uh, for our discussion around defending, detecting, recovering uh, from ransomware in the OT environment. Uh, we'd like to welcome you here today to our conversation just by way of introduction. Uh, there'll be two of us uh, on our discussion today from Verve. Uh, I'm John Livingston, I'm the CEO of Verve. Um, I've been working uh, with Verve for about five years or so, uh, helping to uh, secure the, the world's infrastructure, as we say. Um, and then Ron Brash, my colleague, will be taking the primary lead in the beginning of our presentation. Ron is our Director of Cybersecurity Insights um, and brings uh, about 15 years of experience in all things ICS and OT security. So we're excited to, to hear from him today. Just a quick background on Verve. Um, we've been in business for a little over 25 years uh, in industrial controls, engineering, and security. Uh, our team is composed of both deep, deep OT, ICS, automation, engineering folks, as well as cybersecurity experts like, like Ron. Um, and for the last uh, 12 or 13 years, uh, we've been leading, uh, we've been leveraging our product, the Verve Security Center, to conduct assessments uh, as well as uh, allow our clients to manage their cybersecurity in these OT and ICS environments. And so what you're gonna hear today is a lot of our learnings uh, from that experience over the last uh, uh, 12 or 13 years uh, in our cybersecurity space. So I'll hand it over to Ron now and I'll join you. I'll be back a little bit later to share some more, uh, some more of the perspectives, but Ron, take it away. Thanks, John. So uh, welcome to the party today. Um, this isn't designed to be about uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. This is a frank discussion on what ransomware truly is, uh, and it's not quite exactly how it's being glamorized by the media, how it works from a generic standpoint, including some of the droppers. Uh, but don't be afraid, there's no discussions about bits and bytes. Uh, this is about how does ransomware actually affect operating tech operations technology? How can we protect those organizations and then how to manage it when all else fails? Uh, and you often will hear me use my analogy of driving in the winters in Canada, where you are likely to wind up in a snowbank. So they're, they're very similar analogies, but uh, that's what we're here to talk about. But ultimately, we're here there here today to help you detect, uh, protect and respond to ransomware, help reduce your risk. Uh, and so getting those risks down to a residual level that you're comfortable with. Uh, who should run the, the, pro the recovery process? Because there's a few gaps there that have been demonstrated where if you have the wrong people in charge, uh, you actually will put the process at risk or increase the, the delay in, in, or in recovery. And then how do you kind of work with response uh, proactively uh, to reduce the risks, uh, handle the risks and action upon them, and then also try to prevent the risks and the likelihood. You can't reduce the risk to zero, but you can do a pretty good job. So ransomware is not new. It's existed since the 1980s. Uh, and we'll talk a little more about the timeline there. But if we're looking at the costs by ransomware, uh, as proposed by some of the, the media outlets, they're expecting something around $20 billion to be lost due to it. Now, ransomware is a malicious type of software, but it's actually a collection of malicious things, right? So you've often have heard me say in the past, uh, it's not one vulnerability that usually uh, gets you in trouble, it's the chain of them together that gets you, uh, gets you compromised. Uh, so the objective, though, regardless, is it's a cl those collection of things that to make things systems unstable uh, through the use of encryption and to extort uh, money or even to blackmail the victim for disclosure of sensitive data. Now, that's that's the generic version of it. And that's been the way that this has traditionally been, been used. Uh, and it's usually not strategic in its target selection. It's very happen happenstance. It's indifferent and it's opportunistic, although there is groups that do do focus on some of the big whales. Uh, but that's a very small subset of what you're seeing out there. Now, ultimately, uh, there's other aspects to it, too. So they could target a specific organization and cause uh, disruption, costly disruptions and downtimes, uh, particularly if you're in a region where uh, you're in a bit of economic contention. Um, that might not be true for some of us in the West, but if you're in an area where maybe your neighbors don't like you so much, uh, ransomware can be a very effective tool uh, to manipulating politics in your favor. It can also be used to hide the original crime, right? So if you if you could if it's like false flags and that type of stuff, and I try to avoid those military intelligence uh, uh, paradigms because I think they pollute the real discussion, which is about helping the end user, much less uh, worrying so much about nation state secrets. So 
The things to keep in mind, though, is it's it's very, very prevalent. Uh, there's at least 11 attacks per second, according to some data sources. And if you do look at the data sets, it's being reported that 85 percent of the attacks target Windows systems. Uh, when you look for the actual numbers for that missing 15 percent, it's a bit uh, a bit off. You can't tell they're hidden under this blanket called IoT. Uh, so do keep in mind, uh, most of these attacks and most compromises always originate through Windows systems and commodity infrastructure. So what is old, as I said, continues to thrive. So if we look, there's kind of a humongous upkeep starting circa around 2014 of all of these groups that are looking to ransom things for money. Uh, a lot of them are uh, derivatives of the same thing, right? They're permutations of the same softwares, or maybe it gets forked and someone else decides to go reuse it or, or something gets leaked. Uh, but nonetheless, though, uh, starting 2014 and then moving towards 2017 with, with WannaCry and NotFetcha, things are really picked up, uh, picked up momentum. Now do keep in mind um, that it looks like the numbers and the attacks are going up and skyrocketing and that appears to be the case, but so far they've only really attacked the Windows boxes. Now to look at it from this perspective, there, there's three main components of ransomware. Uh, it works uh, with the concept of, of a dropper. So some, there's a, some sort of initial mechanism to deliver the ransomware itself, that package of, of bad things. And then once that bad set of bad things has, uh, is being executed and has some sort of uh, location where it can you know, freely move about, then it moves to about encrypting the system uh, once it has complete ownership of it. And that once that starts to happen, you know you're in big trouble. And so as you get towards, uh, you know, if you can't detect the dropper in the first place or prevent it, and you can't quickly act upon the dropper and, and stopping any connections from to neighboring systems, uh, you're, you've already jumped into the response and recovery phase. You've already skipped the detect part because if you can't do it there, you're already, it's already over. Um, so as you get towards the encryptor part and towards decryption, your costs have automatically grown uh, exponentially. And so your response will actually change based on that uh, versus the first one is nip it in the bud. And then the other one is, uh, what do I do after my car is smashed up into a wall? Uh, that's kind of how it will work out. Generally speaking, though, ransomware manifests in OT uh, indirectly. It's a cascading uh, collateral effect where you might wind up with a case where some sort of malware ransomware gets implanted into uh, an enterprise system. Although we have seen a case where it was found, uh, a Bitcoin miner was found on a PLC but that's, or on a PAC, but that's something altogether different. Once that malware is in there, it exploits a series of vulnerabilities and then executes further functionality. So you'll see it uh, if someone gets ownership of a, of a machine, though, then they'll go to say, oh, is Windows networking on? Oh, Windows networking is on. What else can I, can I wander around the network and go do? And so OT is typically a manifest of that where those networks are weakly segmented and controlled and a system either gets brought in and, and things are able to bypass into the OT boundaries, whether through virt uh, VPNs, uh, through dual NIC machines and so on and so on. But because of the lack of controls often without, within OT sites, the ransomware is also able to do a couple of different things. And I'll talk more about that, but nonetheless, it, it basically causes the, the spread of impact to become wider and also more uh, immediate and more, and more costly. And then that further gets compromised into OT and OT being further affected because there's a lack of consistent and tested backups. Uh, the restoration is, is involved and lengthy and isn't just as simple as, as uh, restoring a virtual machine image. So it becomes much more than that. And it's also very cyber physical in its dependencies too. But before you kind of look at jumping into the solution to the solutions of ransomware, you need to understand the cost uh, benefit equation. And that also applies to you if you look into this way. Uh, and attack, attackers are gonna look for the, the lowest hanging fruit generally to get the most money. So if, if your lack of preparedness and awareness is zero, you're in really big trouble. If, you're, if the amount of efforts and costs for your recovery are very high and you're not doing anything on it, the attacker is definitely going to go after you because their business model is based on the minimal amount of effort they have to expend to get the most money, the most likelihood, and the quickest to getting it. Uh, you might also find that attackers might know a little bit about your business, right? So the, they, if they know your burn rate or the lost revenue that you're incurring by a disruption is very high or you have dependencies upon you and that cascades, uh, then again, you're also a very susceptible attack. And, and often OT is, 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 the is one of the places where that, that manifests, that consequence. And ultimately, if you have a high number of assets to compromise, uh, then it's also in your, in your best interest to take care of this risk. 
but also it's in the attacker's best interest to go after you too, because the more assets that are compromised, the higher the likelihood of you paying that ransomware or having to deal with extreme measures. So as I said, uh, ransomware has impacted OT, but not in the way per se as everyone says. So you might hear in the news, it says, oh, OT has been impacted at, at ABC car manufacturer. Well, that's not particularly true in many cases. What is, what is really being said is that often IT systems uh, are, effect, are, are affecting OT because they provide functionality to OT, or there's some sort of integration there that enables other business part chains, but doesn't necessarily impact the actual process control itself. However, um, as I said, there's so far, there's almost specific malware that's targeting for, for OT for ransomware is nil. Uh, but because of the interdependency and the connectivity of, of operations and the digitalization effects uh, between industrial automation control systems, IACS, you'll find that this is starting to change the theater of where ransomware can affect OT. If we go towards more of a cloud vertical integrated uh, environment, you're gonna find that you know, commodity ransomware may indeed move around because of the, the, the commoditization of operating systems or, or the interfaces that they use. And so you will find uh, ransomware impacts increasing, um, but not per se uh, attacking OT facilities and, and sites and, and uh, devices inside the environments particularly. So the current realities of ransomware are often like this. I like to use the analogies of broken window theory. So often ra ransomware will take advantage of older unpatched commodity vulnerabilities. And often those that are related around protocols such as SMB, RDP, uh, and that's one of the vectors into the place. It does not mean that it is ransomware itself. Uh, it doesn't go from, go from there. Um, it's, it's just, it's a, usually, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a, a pot, a, a cooking pot of all of those unpatched and weak things, those, those hygienic things that wind up into a worse situation. So if you have one pit of graffiti on a wall, you're very likely to wind up with graffiti, another new set of graffiti tags the next weekend. Uh, and so eventually it'll become the place where all of those risks will converge and you wind up with something bad happening or maybe, uh, or having to deal with that issue. Uh, ransomware payments are, are considered an option of, of ransomware. However, uh, you may be legally responsible for the repercussions of payment. So uh, what you might think you're saving yourself a few dollars today as groups do go about uh, chasing down some of those issues, uh, you're, you might actually wind up in a lawsuit yourself. Uh, people are unknowingly perpetrators, either by the way they click or by human error. Um, and that could be through configurations. That could also be through emails. But so far, most ransomware and malware is typically delivered through human operators uh, and human operators being uh, accidental insiders. The thing about ransomware also is the more we connect our systems and, and air gap is not a solution, by the way, um, except for in very specific use cases where it is applicable. Uh, ransomware has this advantage of being uh, able to attack uh, or those that are operating ransomware have ability to attack anywhere because it's network born. It can go over the internet and it also is endpoint born. So the chances are there's a Windows box, it has a way in or a Mac or a Linux machine. It doesn't matter. And you can't say Linux and Macs do not have the possibility of being ransomed either. But ultimately the reality is most organizations are not sufficiently protected. They do not have finance adequate financial reserves to handle a widespread disruption, much less the, a very extensive recovery. And they're often not engaged properly in security maintenance. So from technicalities, I do wanna talk about WannaCry because yes, it is older, uh, everyone should know it, um, but I don't wanna beat a dead horse. Uh, what, I, what I do wanna talk about though is the way that it works is the same across the board, generally speaking. Uh, it managed to gain in over three phases, gain entry. It was a, someone was able to drop dependencies and there's been cases where people have gotten privileged access and you've used active directory trees to further uh, the, the impact of a compromise, but they do imagine initially get uh, a place to drop dependencies, whether that's through email, uh, through an unprotected RDP session, whatever have you. Then they're able to exploit that vulnerability and then they go after getting persistence. And there's a number of ways that they can go about doing so, but ultimately it involves uh, basically taking ownership of that system in a way that you can't easily undo it. Once that occurs, there's usually a call home function to a command and control center, and then it starts looking for neighbors. And those neighbors are systems that are adjacent to it, or they could be other network segments. So segmentation by itself is not a per se, uh, a safe way of deterring and stopping malware. What it can do if you properly protect it, right? There's a difference between segmenting network traffic and then also isolating network traffic to only authorized uh, flows. Those are two different things, but nonetheless, 
you, the malware will go about uh, finding neighbors. If there's vulnerable neighbors, it will exploit those neighbors. And then those communities will then continue to affect other communities of vulnerable systems. Now, if all of that starts to happen, uh, and simultaneously, what you'll probably also see occurring is the total ownership part, where the attacker's got a foothold, the attacker has taken an impact uh, or compromised a bunch of systems, but the impact is not necessarily immediate yet. What will happen then is they'll access the files. It'll disable your recovery mechanisms if possible. It'll look for the coverage of the host. So do I have all the things on it that I want? Have I stopped all the processes to make sure that there's nothing running in memory to help you uh, recover? Uh, especially including, for example, uh, pushing a database back to disk so I can get access to it and disrupt everything at, at once, right? In case there's any file locking. And then it will encrypt all the files. And once it's done that, it'll give you a nice little notification saying, hey, pay, pay me X amount of Bitcoin or whatever your cryptocurrency is. Now, I keep mentioning Windows. Uh, it's, it, yes, ransomware is generally for Windows, but it's not. And I've been hypothesizing this for a while. So if you look at some of the other ransomwares out there, they're going after your, your uh, network area storage devices, your NASes. So far, there's been three cases where BrickerBot has been bricking devices, uh, bricking the framework, which doesn't really serve much of a purpose, to be honest, but nonetheless, it is a strategy out there. It's a naive one. Then you have Age Locker and Echo Rakes, and they're going after the, your QNAPs, uh, especially when many of them torrent to private clouds. And then also your other things like ready NASs, which are often uh, deployed in field or in small uh, offices or satellite posts. So ransomware is going after commodity embedded systems, but not your industrial control systems yet. But there is, there is some overlap there, and I'll talk about that next. When you're looking at those extra things, and I borrowed the slide from my embedded presentation, but embedded systems with file systems and exposed components like a web server or a telnet server, SSH, risk the inevitable of being a part of a ransomware attack. Now, the, the handling of that is going to be very drastic. If, the, if those devices get ransomed, there's probably not enough real spares in the world to handle those type of issues. Or you probably don't have the on the shelf or, or the return time to go get a, a replacement device is in, is in measured in weeks. And, and that's very different than just restoring a Windows update and rebuilding it from scratch, uh, that host. But to separate that out, uh, I've marked the differences between orange and black. The orange ones are potential ways in. So if you see an embedded system that has a Linux operating system, it could be fed a malicious configuration out of band. It could have an entry pathway over network. So most people say, oh, well, if I used uh, S if um, Linux boxes aren't using SMB, they're using Samba. Well, actually it's the same protocol. But the real issue is, is that those protocols, if there's a weakness, allow uh, persons and, and applications to write uh, executable code on their systems if there's a, such a sufficient vulnerability. If there is, that is a way to move laterally from system to system, right? So you get access to one Windows or a Linux system, and that Linux system is able to instantiate a shell on another Linux system. Then you wind up with the same lateral movement that would be present over SMB, just that it's not as obvious as uh, the very chatty Windows protocols for networking. Uh, and that's true not just for Windows, by the way. It's, it's all of those protocols that do the similar functions, like Dropbox. Uh, change your default weak credentials. Most of the time, OT systems don't have uh, hard, sufficiently hardened credentials, or they're running the defaults. Well, most of these malwares, they try all the defaults in many cases before they go get administrative passwords. Well, you might want to reduce that risk, and that might actually give you enough time to sufficiently stop this attack from affecting those very costly assets. And then there's also very other, various other ways to introduce uh, malware to a system, and one of the malwares might be a ransomware uh, type uh, attack, but through logic errors in programs, right? So do keep those in mind. But when you're looking at the embedded systems, there's a differentiator here between a commodity Windows or a Mac or Linux system and an embedded one. If it's an RTOS, a real-time operating system that is sufficiently uh, tasked with a very particular goal, and it doesn't have very uh, extensive capabilities enabled on it or compiled into it or in that firmware, then some of these things might not work the same way. But if you are running a Linux machine and it's running on ARM and it's probably using U-Boot, and QNX would also probably have very similar uh, effects to the same with VxWorks. Uh, these, there's a few things that are very ideal to ransom. One is the storage device, the storage interfaces and devices and the partitions on that file system. If you brick the firmware, there's no recovering from that. You don't have the tools to go lift it. You don't have the tools to go reprogram that chip. The manufacturer may have them, or it will ship you a brand new one and you need to rebuild from scratch. There's also a couple other capabilities in there, which is where in many systems, you would just tweak the bootloader and I, I could brick it without encrypting anything and nobody has access to what's on it. It's more 
there's no goal in encrypting the, the firmware per se and the systems that are on it, but the goal is to ransom and say that you can't reboot that system because I've made a change. If you touch it, then you're in trouble. And if I do do that, uh, you're gonna wind up with the infamous uh, Google Chrome error, like if she's dead, Jim, uh, then you'll have no failover and, re and recovery. So even there's, there is some ways around that making redundant firmwares, but do keep in mind that embedded ransomware is not necessarily gonna be about encrypting your files and, and data security. It's gonna be about disrupting process and disrupting process can be very, very costly. So this is what I just wanna bring about that there's a risk here and that's why you wanna make adequate controls to stop uh, and, and processes around stopping the attacks where they're very likely to, uh, to occur and, and just being aware of the other risks. So to circle back on our original goal, which is how do we detect or protect, detect, identify and respond to ransomware? Everyone tells you you need to do 80 things, if not maybe 250, if we took all of the, the NIST special publications into account. But if we're using the NIST CSF model, uh, everyone's gonna tell you that there's five areas and you should be doing something all of them. And maybe there's a, maybe a sixth area, which is awareness and training, right? It's gonna tell you you need to have a very strong identify function. It's gonna tell you that you need to do a whole bunch of protective activities. Uh, it's gonna tell you to do your best chances of response and ransomware is about detect and respond and then ultimately recovery. But what these models aren't telling you is, is something along a different set of lines. The models are unequal. They imply equality when the reality of their application is uneven. So let's take this for example, again, the NIST CSF wheel. It, it's a great model, don't get me wrong, in a framework, but you're gonna use it a little differently based on the situation that you're into. Every time that you have a ransomware incident, you're automatically going to response and recovery. It doesn't matter because you're, you're, you're already infected and you're compromised. The, the, the depth and how deep you are in, tr in trouble, that's a different story altogether. And that will ultimately affect your response and recovery. But once it's already occurring, it's occurred. And the, what do you do from that point? There's also a massive over-reliance on detect. How often can any, any team respond to an initial outbreak in less than an hour? What if it's, if it, in an hour is the best case, what if it's even faster? What are you going to do? Well, you're going to automatically go to the recover and respond functions because you're already in trouble. So the capabilities are not equal in their effectiveness and they're also not equal in their weight, depending on where you are in that timeline that I showed with the dropper, the decryptor and, and the encryptor, depending on where you are in that timeline, different capabilities will have different weights. And so they're not uniform in their application, much less they're also their, their effectiveness in, in delivering resi uh, residual risk reductions. So do keep those in mind. So to, to further emphasize my point, and this is where my boss is nice and lets me use uh, some creative analogies, I like to use golfing. So my parents live on a golf course and you've got a few chances. I'm terrible at golfing. My boss, John, here is a great golfer, uh, much better than me, but if I start on the first hole and I'm, and I'm you know, kind of sloppy, I'm gonna slice and put the ball into the bushes. And if I continue down that path, I'm gonna lose all my balls uh, and I might wind up with a few in the pond and then I have to go start digging them out. And if I really am not careful, uh, I might wind up almost uh, causing an incident with a person or which by the way, I'm responsible for the actions of my ball and, and so on. And I need to deal with the recovery and the response of that activity. Uh, or I wind up with no balls and I, and I have to quit the game. But nonetheless, with ransomware, you often will see events uh, early on, and those events will cluster very rapidly, which implies that you automatically need to go from a detection-based uh, detection mechanism to a strategy that's more focused on isolating and responding and, and recovering from that issue. So there's a very, very quick time window where detection might help you and may help you to it already happened and it has no value. Uh, yes, of course, it'll give you a monitoring perspective of the entire situation, but it's not going to be quite the same. And nonetheless, whatever you do, it will always wind up in the same case where you have a system uh, that is irresponsive. So contrary to popular belief, uh, you can't have detection without protections. If you don't have antivirus alert, antivirus installed or any anti-malware or sort of endpoint protection system, you can't have logs. If you don't have audit policy enabled on your endpoints, you won't see uh, someone instantiating or a new process. So there's, there's things that, that you need. And to do that, it all comes together, right? So if you, if you can't track uh, ac or accesses over a network or firewall or have control over an access control, then you're in trouble. It can easily move about. 
uh, if you don't have user policies and prote protections in place, everyone's as, running as administrator. Well, then it's already over before it started. Uh, backups and virtualization are a key part of protection, and yet they're also a fundamental part of recovery. And, and so you will find that those are very tightly linked, and yet there's the maybe the weights of those different controls will change in their in their in their priorities, and they're not and they're not static. So recently, I saw. A, a, a Cisco document outlining that maybe protection was one of the last things you should do. I would argue that maybe it's one of close to, but maybe not the first thing you should do, which is not relying entirely on detection, which they say what had the most value. So ultimately, uh, all that needs to be pulled together inside into an identify function. Now you might also say, well, okay, well, protection begins at the network layer. And it's great that it does, and it does provide you a certain level of measurable uh, 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 risk reduction. But if you look at all of these things, you'll see that, oh, there's a lot of networking things I need to do. Okay, so I need to manage my secure remote access. I need to manage my perimeter firewall. How about firewalls inside of it? What about uh, segments inside of it? Oh, but what about my NAT routers and my DPI appliances or my islands? There's all of those things there. And did you properly secure the conduits and zones? So what you might have a network that is uh, separated out into multiple segments, but are you limiting the traffic between them? Are you limiting it to only specific hosts between the zones and the conduits? Uh, so, but that's not everything, right? This is only assuming that, that your network has sufficient controls. But what happens if I take control of a privileged asset? So design of a network uh, isn't, and the security of isn't enough. As we might know, most malware seems to come in through Windows machines. So endpoints therefore need protection. And that's not just Windows machines. That's also including hardening your, your malware or uh, sorry, hard, I was looking at the wrong thing, uh, hardening your, your uh, network infrastructure. So therefore it can't be just about networks. Uh, what about those assets that move around frequently? And we're seeing more and more of those as we go because it's more cost effective. Uh, but nonetheless, misconfigured endpoints are a key contributor into uh, uh, enabling an environment that, is, that, that will cause the growth of a ransomware attack or allow it to manifest. Uh, lack of hygiene and being very behind is an indicative uh, behavior that might demonstrate that you might be more susceptible to a ransomware attack. Humans click things, so no amount of training is going to solve that. So you want to try and uh, you want to try to mitigate that with some other controls that maybe can at least help honest people stay honest. USB sticks are still being used. Well, if you did have network protections, it's very easy for me to leave a USB stick with some gifts on it in, in a parking lot. Uh, wormable malware. So. Uh, there's a question here about uh, if I enforce least pr privilege, can ransomware still do damage? Yes, because if you don't have the other sufficient hardening uh, around on a system, you might find that they actually can put themselves into a place where they've manipulated a file and then that file will get clicked and dragged somewhere else. And so it's not just about uh, least privilege, um, it's about trusting the, the individuals that interact with those flows. So some might say a zero trust model, that might be true, but it's it won't necessarily stop it. And also, uh, when you do enforce least privilege, you often will, you might find that some users are going to become uh, creative in their, in their usage of, of some of the operating system functionalities or, or, or other uh, mechanisms. And so they might go around some of your uh, controls and you need to also be considered of how and when to use them. So I'll pass this over to John here. Sure. Thanks, Ron. Uh, appreciate that. Um, so as Ron has mentioned uh, and kind of taken you through a bit of the, the sort of the history of ransomware, how it impacts a system, uh, and then, you know, what are the kinds of things you can do to start to fit? Um, there is a lot of focus around uh, the detection side of things. And I think in OT specifically, uh, people get very focused on that because it seems like, well, I can't really do much to the endpoint. So therefore I'll focus on the detection side. And if I can detect it and respond, uh, that's about as good as I can do. And what we're here to argue is that you need to have a much more balanced approach. And as Ron said, if you wait till all your, till the detection part, uh, things have probably gotten past where, where they need to be. And so uh, our focus is on to ensure you have the other pieces of that NIST framework uh, in place, the identify piece, uh, as well as the protection pieces. Ron's talked a lot about the network protection piece. But as we think about this, we think about it as a, uh, essentially having a 360 degree view of that risk in your environment. So you really get a visibility of, you know, A, what do I have on my system? 
making sure that you have visibility into all the software, not just the OSs, but, but what's, the op, what's the underlying application software and what versions are they running? Um, what are the published vulnerabilities for those and the missing patches? So you have clear visibility into what is your current risk level on those endpoints. Then, but again, it's not just about patching, even patch systems sometimes can be taken advantage of. So we then think about configuration. Do you have secure configurations? Pick your favorite standard, there are a variety of them. Um, we've built some at Verve, which are specific for OT or ICS systems to harden down those uh, secure configurations to make sure you have another layer of defense. Ron mentioned user accounts. I would say that typically when we do a, hey Ron, can you just go back one page? Typically when we do a, a vulnerability assessment, uh, we find uh, on most machines that you've got a number anywhere from five to 10 accounts on there that are admin level accounts that shouldn't be there. Or alternatively on each device, you may have um, you know, dozens of dormant uh, accounts that haven't been used in 180 days or 90 days, et cetera. Um, and that these are other access points uh, for attackers to get into your OT systems. Um, knowing your anti-malware status, are you protected from that? Do you have, as Ron mentioned before, misconfigured network protections? Are you sure you've got backup status? Do you know which assets are most critical? By having that comprehensive integrated view, you then can take a, a series of steps around starting to protect yourself uh, from these risks. So we'll go to the next page here. Um, as we think about that then, it really starts with that asset and vulnerability view. And so these are just some screenshots uh, that we pulled from the Verve platform, but we always think you should start with really understanding where are your assets um, and breaking them down by site. Uh, and what this shows is by type. So get it down to you know, your PLCs, how many of them are PLC fives? You know, this is Rockwell type stuff, how many are Modicon? Um, uh, all the way down to your protective relays, your RTUs, your controllers, et cetera. Um, and then by having that deep, deep asset visibility, you can then start to overlay your vulnerabilities by asset type, by the type of impact, is it network-based? Uh, does it focus uh, on uh, integrity, accessibility, and then being able to really narrow down to which are the assets that I have that are the highest risks? Which are those that have the most critical vulnerabilities in my environment? And then obviously overlaying the actual asset criticality to your process on that. And by having that, that kind of complete view of your of your assets and your vulnerabilities. And then Ron, I'll go to the next page if I could, you know, and then down to the user and account risk, right? So as I mentioned before, right? In this particular, this is a demo environment, but, you know, account assets where we've got, you know, 69 assets where we've got inactive users on them. We've got admin users with expired passwords, uh, administrator accounts, um, you know, multiple, multiple administrator accounts per host. Um, local users per host. Uh, point is that these users and accounts uh, that we have, we need to make sure are, are narrowed down because this is just another access point uh, for attackers to get in and plant ransomware or frankly do other kinds of damage. So this is part of that 360 degree view of that endpoint uh, protection. Next page. And then as, as I mentioned before, understanding the configuration so, uh, and, and how secure your configurations are. So we've built uh, a set of configuration checks that are ICS or OT specific. And then we run that against all of the uh, devices in the environment so that you can see, okay, am I, is this configuration as hardened as it can be and secure as it can be? Uh, because I may not be able to patch every device immediately in OT, but I certainly can harden those configurations as much as I can. And then once I set a target, is that device green or red against that configuration standard? So if I have a configuration setting, how many of my devices are actually green? Are they set appropriately? And then monitoring that on an ongoing basis to ensure you've got your, your settings uh, appropriate or alternatively going in and hardening those configs as need be. 
again, trying to focus as much as we possibly can on building those layers of protection so you're not just dependent on uh, a detection layer uh, to capture that ransomware. Next page, Ron. Um, now, you know, this is not to say that that detection is not important. Um, we, we clearly recognize you need to have uh, a central place where you're bringing in those detections um, and, and have a, a, an effective SIM, which is monitoring and tracking uh, each event and then responding to those in a rapid fashion. Um, and that should come up and have a central alerting on alarms and then building specific signal detection rules for these ransomware events. And one of the great things is that as soon as these are discovered, there's lots of signals that come out that we can put into a, a SIM platform um, that can then detect those on a, on a rapid basis. But again, detection is not the first line of defense. Uh, it's the last line of defense in some way. You want to put up as many barriers as you can uh, and then have detection uh, as a fallback in case those other things uh, don't always work. Um, we can detect anomalous patterns of behaviors and signals. Um, and so it's critical. It's just, it needs to be balanced. But one of the most important things, and I'll go back to Ron's golf analogy, is that we need to move very quickly from detection to response and then action. So I think one of the things we find most often um, uh, when we, we go into a client and we'll assess their current situation is we find that they um, they may have monitoring and, uh, and, and event sources. Uh, they may have some incident response plan in place, but the speed at which that process happens and the ability to rapidly take actions is where it, it starts to fall down. And so, making sure that you know, you're, you're putting these pieces together of having event integrated monitoring, um, making sure you've got those events into some policy and protection guidelines, but then on the right-hand side, making sure you work through, analyzing the time series, discovering the attack path, and then moving to action. I think one of the key things that we've been developing over the last 10 years is, is actually putting the, the remediation and response platform integrated with the protection and detection platform. So you're not having to pivot from one tool to another tool, et cetera. You can, you can very quickly go from, I found a problem and now I'm gonna go fix that problem on that specific endpoint. Um, it's one of the keys to getting this done effectively is to have a very, very fast cycle time from, from uh, detection to response in case the protections uh, don't hold up. Next page. I think one of the questions that comes up very, very frequently when we have these conversations is, so who, who should do what? What is that process? How do we get you know, this effectively done? And so our view is uh, this is not an IT problem. It is not an OT problem. It is a joint problem. As, as Eric Cosman from ISA says, it's OIT, Operational Information Technology. Um, and we need to bring the capabilities of IT you know, in terms of Look, they can establish uh, common metrics and objectives uh, around cybersecurity uh, standards. Uh, they can provide security and vulnerability analysis. They can provide the signatures of these of these ransomware attackers. I mean, the great Ron pointed out earlier, right, almost all this stuff comes from the IT side into OT, and so there's a lot that IT can help with in terms of building those processes and those signals, etc. But on the OT side, uh, the folks who are going to manage those protection elements, ensure the inventory is up to date, ensure the patching is done effectively, ensure that those configuration settings are hardened, the networks are hardened, but done in a way that is safe for operations, that really has to be done by a team of OT practitioners. Um, we can't, we all know these OT systems are too sensitive to be having people push patches from 3,000 miles away. Um, that team on site that team of engineers really understands their systems the best. And when can we deploy updates? Uh, when can we remove users and accounts? What is that software that's on a device really used for? Do we really need it? Um, and then most importantly, when it comes to the incident response, those OT folks are gonna be in the saddle, right? If, if we do end up uh, having a ransomware event, it is gonna be the OT team that's gonna have to recover from the backups uh, and, and get those plants up and running again get those machines up and running again, reprogram them, 
re refresh them from backups, whatever it happens to be. But those teams can then come together to build those playbooks, develop compensating controls if necessary, where certain you know, patches can't be deployed. Okay, what's the right compensating control? And then finally really nail down those recovery strategies for OT. I think the example that may best talk to this is what happened with Merck. Um, as many of you know, it was very public. Uh, Merck was uh, impacted by the NotPetya uh, ransomware. Um, in their annual report, they estimated this was a $900 million cost item. Um, there's been other reports that would put it north of a billion, but in any event, a huge number. The incident response part though, of this, of this uh, wiperware event, basically, um, it, was, it was on the head of the head of supply chain to make this happen. IT was certainly helpful, but it was the supply chain team that had to do this, the manufacturing folks, um, because they understood their systems. Uh, they had to source, they had to change their sourcing and supply chains while the, the systems were set back up. All of the restart processes required process control knowledge of those OT systems. Um, and it was, it was a huge amount of time. So, you know, there's, Ron mentioned that, you know, 99% of this ransomware comes from IT. However, you know, if it crosses that bridge, which it does frequently, uh, if it gets in, if it crosses over into, uh, into OT and it's doing it more and more because of the, the reduction of, of the, um, the air gaps and all the rest of that, OT is going to be responsible for fixing it. And so OT needs to be involved in protecting it. OT needs to have a very strong hand in our view of setting up those protections, whether they be network or endpoint protections and having a very clear role in the incident response when those, uh, if, if something is detected and have clear steps of being able to take rapid action that's safe in the OT environment. So with that, I'll hand it back to Ron uh, for some final thoughts about uh, how do you think about responding overall, Ron? Sounds good. So it's not a dumpster fire, um, much made me like some of us think about 2020, but uh, what, what we're trying to say to people is that to do, to recover in ransomware, particularly in OT takes a slightly different approach that needs to accommodate safety, reliability, and productivity, SRP, as we like to call it. Um, once you recognize that there's an event occurring, it's already occurred. So you need to work with uh, handling it, right? It'd be like just like having a fire. You don't need to know necessarily how the fire started per se, although it is important to understand where your surroundings are, especially if there's gas and so on. But you need to understand automatically, how do I move to putting out that fire, extinguishing it and going, going from there? So once you've identified uh, that an event is occurring, you want to triage it and figure out what type of event, right? Because not all ransomwares are gonna be built the same. Neither all, neither all incidents nor malwares. You're gonna bring out the right playbook for that scenario. You're gonna immediately engage with the OT lead in charge for safe event handling. You don't just go pull the wires on a switch to try to prevent uh, further lateral movement if you don't know what's communicating through that switch or that router. How would you know? Um, you need to identify the entry pathways, right? So some of those might be uh, also very important to the ICS community that's running inside your organization, but uh, you need to understand that and be able to close those off as a preventative measure. Uh, you might want to have some sort of pre-isolation uh, plans ahead of time, right? So that would be like the drawbridges, right? So you want to affect other segments and systems. Often we've seen networks that are segmented to a certain degree, at least in the network conceptualization, but they're not actually isolated from each other. Um, you know, those assets can't talk to the internet, but they can talk to the firewall at another site. Uh, that's something you want to isolate very quickly on. And that can also be done in a safe way, kind of as a, as a pre-emergency plan, right? Before you jump into the actual uh, containment of maybe a site, uh, you might want to at least isolate the other sites off, which are maybe uh, independent of the others. So do keep those in mind. Um, minus the typo, uh, contain the environment and halt the execution. So what we're saying by that is isolate the site, isolate down the pieces that you know are, are, to be, uh, are to be impacted, right? So often you might see if ransomware did get to maybe inside of the, the SCADA and the PCN network, uh, that might be very, it may, may be very dramatic, uh, but the actual process might still be safe, right? So there might be uh, HMIs inside of machine units on, on, a, on a process control line up producing consumer goods. And that is completely isolated and safe by itself. There's, no, there's, that, there's human operators manning it, um, there might not be any ways into it. And so they might be safe for the moment. So try to think about as a way to contain and halt your environment based on the functional uh, components there. And that's also another reason why you need to have zoning and conduits and adequate controls. 
uh, that promote action. Now, before you move into the recovery, you need to understand that are your backups any good? Uh, you should hopefully have tested them out of band, but you do want to make sure that they're tested and, and they're relatively recent, good, uh, safe conditions, right? Um, particularly if maybe there's maybe a gift that's been imparted inside of those backups that you thought was good. But before you move straight to the recovery part, you need to make sure that whatever it is inside of there is at least hardened or there's workarounds to try and prevent the reinfection. The last thing you want to do is chase your own tail. So for example, uh, SMB might be set to still version 1.0, but you don't you know that that's an unnecessary uh, default construction. So you can move to SMB version two and have some other the uh, Windows policies enabled that would remove that. Or maybe if there's an IPv6 uh, stack issue and that's being exploited, we'll turn off the IPv6 stack because you know you're not using it. So there is some preventative things you can be doing as part of that recovery process there as well. Uh, and then ultimately, when you move to your full recovery, validate the processes and all the related systems are optimal. I know it sounds like a given, but often what is obvious needs to be said out loud. The other piece that needs to be said out loud is ransomware, if you get it, is not a one-time thing. It's not like the chicken pox, although arguably you get the shingles from chicken pox, but uh, do get ready for the next wave. Ransomware is not a one-time event and neither is malware. It will continue to happen if you don't, uh, if you don't keep managing the, the issues that kind of lead to an infection but also the fact that it's, it's very likely that, you will, you, that some, something, something new will, will arise from the depths of the internet and you'll wind up in a similar situation once again. So whatever investment you do into preventing and dealing with a ransomware incident should be a multiplier to your further investments and, and, and the way that you manage your processes and, and your efficiency. But throughout that, very few people talk about it and, and Norsk and some of the others and maybe even FireEye in this case uh, are kind of the, the leaders in that is they're trying to be transparent. So you want to ongoingly and transparently engage and communicate with all of your stakeholders, not just dominate or keep it to a select few. That doesn't help anyone, but that's just, that's an end-to-end -end strategy. Um, there is a special publication, 1826. Uh, it does talk about some of the data integrity uh, events, ransomware being one of them. It is a recommendation. I don't agree with much of the, the in insights and input, but it is a good starting place to get look, to look for some extra ransomware and, and similar type events uh, handling. So four key takeaways out of all of this is, is just this. To do ransomware protection and detection and response well, you need to have a very strong identification and protection strategy. But even if you did have such a good strategy, you need to have OT and ICS knowledge embedded in it. Without that knowledge, without it being able to identify and protect your assets, it's gonna be very burdensome. You're, you're actually increasing your chances of making a mistake, which is a further delay you probably can't afford or it's gonna cause other effects that you, don't, that you don't wish to happen. And that might not even be the attacker's original intentions. So don't be your own worst enemy. Tribal knowledge is, is required, uh, but you can use those, those same protections and, uh, as a way to reduce your risk and speed up your recovery. Uh, as John said, detection isn't useless, but uh, it can be enhanced for OT functions. So you could integrate into some of those alerts and cases and say, uh, in a way like, you know, we're moving directly to recovery, but there is a fire here at site, at site A, right? You can use it as, as, a, as a gauge of, of risks uh, or areas where you think a, an impending compromise is going to occur. And you can maybe devote some of your uh, work around it, but also you, can al you also need to uh, infuse the, any, any sort of alerting system or SOCs uh, with OT uh, relevant signatures and detections, but it shouldn't be re relied upon. Another key thing, and it's been mentioned by others in the industry, is often these OT sites are defensible positions. They are often very steady, they're, they're steady state. They don't have that much change. Um, the, the technologies, the processes and people are typically very static. Um, but when you're looking at, at managing ransomware or malware, it requires timeliness. And most of these environments are slow moving uh, due to the way that they operate with very strict change controls for, for physical safety and stuff like that. So you do need to make sure uh, when you are doing OT, OT security, you need to make sure it makes sense across the PPT, people, process, and technology uh, mindset, but also for SRP. And you need to treat it just like it's a fire drill. Um, end to end, uh, end to end coverage of, of any policies and procedures, end to end training, end to end everything. And, and if you do have processes already there, and most of the time you do, uh, you can actually easily adapt many of those for cyber functions instead of recreating the wheel and, and making new mechanisms. Uh, and and it, just, it's, it eases some of that burdens there. Uh, ransomware also is a cascading, cascading failure where often one tiny failure leads to a bigger one and so on. And so therefore you automatically will go to rest restoration. It's very, very likely. But time is of the essence and there are differences between those IT systems 
and the OT systems, but also how you recover between those two worlds. There will be differences. Often in IT, you can quickly uh, isolate and compromise a system and recovery can be quickly executed, but you can't go shut down a, a virtualization cluster that's managing uh, a bunch of your historians and your environmental data and compliance data. Or for example, if there's an HMI that controls all everything else, that maybe that system might need to be up and left, left until a particular down window. So another example of that would be like, some would say, configure doesn't do anything, so leave it alone until our next down window. I don't argue that that's the best course of action, um, but you do need to have a lot of balances there and a decisional matrix to guide your decisions uh, versus just you know uh, throwing water on the fire and hoping for the best and it wasn't, uh, wasn't a chemical fire. So uh, do, do keep your strategies in mind there. And that kind of wraps us up today. Um, and we got to about 10 minutes to spare, so that's perfect. Uh, maybe, maybe Megan or John wants to MC some of the questions. Sure, Ron, thanks for the presentation. Um, we had a couple questions come in in the q and I don't know if you want to start with those that came in while you were presenting. Sure, sure. Um, actually, so the Honda one is an interesting one, and I don't know who's asking that, um, and I will be careful about what I'm going to say. Uh, with the Honda attack, it hasn't been publicly acknowledged, but some of the subsidiaries were indeed affected because of IT systems. And IT systems, in a sense, did affect OT because of a, a common uh, phenomenon and paradigm called uh, just-in-time manufacturing, where you have, for example, if you're building cars, you're not going to build engines at the same plant that you're building the cars and their lineups. So you can't have cars rolling off the, off the, off the robotic floor if there's no engines into them, because a, a critical step in that is, is being, uh, being missed. So there was a big cascade there where many of their subsidiaries were not able to, uh, to complete orders and transactions between sites and plants. So do keep in mind, uh, IT systems enabled OT processes to occur, but OT wasn't, uh, for example, unsafe because of it. So that is often one of the main cases. And as you see people going towards digitalization, you'll see more and more of that effect. Uh, you, could, you could easily go see it the next time you go to the airport, uh, maybe in 2021, where the moment you check in your suitcase, the plane has to take off with you on it, or that suitcase has to be removed. And so there's a process dependency there, but, but the actual operational safety has not been compromised per se. Uh, by that action. So do keep in mind that it, it, it takes a different mindset uh, versus just looking at it from like the CIA data security triads. At what level should we be working on OT device inventories, identifying device type, will that be enough? Or should we reach to another level of knowledge uh, for managing it? Well, arguably uh, that's a very good function for a bunch of things, including if you have to be aligned with nerc -SIP. Uh, What you might also see that uh, that's just an identifying function, right? That helps you figure out what you need to recover. Uh, and often cases, if you did have an issue with having to reload a cabinet uh, and it's all of its firmware and, and logic, chances are most, most play, especially older sites don't have that knowledge on hand. And so it would, it would uh, not necessarily stop you from doing a full recovery, but it would definitely impede you. Uh, and you could say the same thing about not per se devices, but also the Windows machines, the, the same logic, just that they'll, they'll be affected differently, but the, the same principles do, do exist for all of those. I think Ron, one of the questions, the, the, the follow on question there of, should you reach to the level of knowing the firmware versions? The answer to that is yes. Without the firmware versions, um, it is impossible to know if you've got a vulnerability on that device because those vulnerabilities are actually tied back to the firmware versions. So without essentially uh, reaching out to those devices and gathering back their firmware, uh, you will not get visibility into the vulnerabilities uh, on those devices. Uh, Ron, there's a couple of answers of questions in the chat as well. Uh, the first one is around, does a solution integrate to push active blocking on the industrial firewalls? Uh, the answer to that is yes, we can uh, integrate with the industrial firewalls um, and essentially uh, uh, send commands to those devices. To be very clear, we do not do that in an automated way. Um, it, you know, one could put in a, a, a firewall and, and use the firewall in an, in an active way. Our view is that we want to make sure that OT engineer uh, is in the middle of the response process. And so uh, our pro process, our workflow is that we identify, if it's a detection element, we identify the detection, and then we create the, essentially the workflow or the, or the playbook for someone to execute 
on uh, uh, making that command through the firewall, but we don't do that in an automated way because of the potential downside risks of being wrong and the, uh, the risk of having a false alarm that shuts down your plan. And then Ron, there's some questions about uh, the OT protocol. Maybe you wanna address sure. a couple of those. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, salut, uh, Youssef. Um, so when you're looking at uh, things like SMB and IPv6, V6, right? Those are those are commodity stacks that are used on Windows machines. Although arguably OPC Classic uh, does use Windows DCOM based uh, functionality for a bunch of things. Uh, what you do need to keep in mind is almost nobody in their right mind will use IPv6 in the current future, unless maybe you're in a very different space where you have uh, many, many assets, you need them all to be uniquely done. And let's say, for example, it was maybe the largest, largest building on earth for building aircraft, right? There might be a reason to have that many devices and that many connected things. And so you may choose to use IPv6. But for the most part, uh, most businesses are not using IPv6. And so that would be an easy one to bypass, which would be to turn off that stack. So you could, uh, you could, go, you could work about removing it. There has been no uh, OT protocol per se being used uh, in ransomware. And, and when you say OT, I think you mean industrial control system protocol. So I'll make a differentiation there. Uh, you probably you will not see them being used for propagation. Uh, however, there is cases where you can use some of those industrial control pr protocols to do routing. So if you take Ethernet IP or SIP, and this is Ethernet not as an Ethernet layer two, this is Ethernet SIP. Uh, you can have, uh, for example, devices route traffic across backplanes and out a different configuration card to a network segment that you, or a machine network that you thought was isolated. So in theory, you could have an industrial control system uh, protocol contributing in a ransomware attack, but you, that, that is top tier, right? That would be your target security level four that you're trying to protect against. Uh, and let, or maybe you have a relay on the other side and maybe that'll push it off to a Windows box. But then that depends on how that stack is being parsed and how that is implemented. There, there's so many nuanced perspectives to it. Um, another perspective here would be uh, if you're looking at, for example, at, yes, we do asset management and vulnerability solutions. Uh, arguably, we are not, we're not in the NIDS net market. I was the person who wrote the ICS detection challenge data sets. And what I can tell you is under the best circumstances, maybe you will identify up to 70% of the assets by MAC address and IP. That is insufficient for understanding the risks and, and the things that are on those systems. So let me give you a prime example here of Windows traffic. If you were to look at just the traffic, you might see that you might have Windows 7 or Windows 10 on the network, but you do not know the exact build number that that system is. You do not know the exact patches. You do not know the configuration of that asset. You do not know what applications are installed. And if they're not broadcasting, you don't know that it's listening, right? For example, team viewers on it. You will never know that over the network traffic unless it's communicating. The other piece here that you'll is very commonly forgotten about is that almost no relevant information on most industrial control systems is present during steady state on a network. And what I mean by that is most of the asset information only occurs when someone probes those devices with let's say RS logics and you see uh, ID identity commands being issued you won't see um, most of that information unless being directly queried or during startup and responses. Uh, and, and by the way, thanks John for joining us today. John's just stepping out. Um, you won't get all that information. You won't be able to identify where those holes are and those risky, the risky businesses are. Um, you can uh, you use those type of things to augment it. And also you'll find as we go towards uh, encrypted secure protocols, passive anomaly detection uh, is easily going to be Include it into uh, into other solutions, but it but it also will re will actually uh, have reduced return ROI because of encryption. Nobody in their right mind is going to give a third party solution the keys to the kingdom on some other asset, right? It's just exposing them the risk to another level uh, and on another asset I need to maintain. So you, there's a bunch of risks there on on that. Um, we do have uh, another question there, which is that third point from Youssef, which is ICS specific configuration checks. Yes. And we can also do that for HMI. So for example, if you're following the Schneider Electric uh, HMI guide or pick your secure deployments from GE, uh, the same mechanism applies to all of those assets. Now it gets a bit harder, harder for the embedded systems, but uh, a set of derivative checks can be easily uh, pr programmed in and performed. But also most of the times is there's often offline configuration files that can be also used and audited, um, although they do have their limitations and you can go around it as well. Um, we can do active checks on those hosts and, and also offline passive checks. So there's, there's a bunch of ways to do that, uh, but we're kind of getting away from what the real point of the webinar, which is about ransomware. 
Uh, and as we're kind of wrapping up the end of the session, uh, I'm just looking for one last ma major question here, which I think is a, is a very critical point, is, uh, there's actually, I think I've answered just about all of them. Um, I think, no, I think I've answered just about all of them. So if there's any follow-up questions, uh, I would be more than happy to answer any of them. Uh, by direct email, by LinkedIn, I'm very relatively easy to find, uh, or you can contact uh, Megan Ganser, who's our director of marketing, and uh, we can we can go from there and establish any further follow ups. Or maybe if there's enough input, maybe I'll write up a blog or something along those lines. But but nonetheless, the session has been recorded. Uh, you can easily reach out to us, and uh, I really would like to thank all of you for for sticking through this for for an hour of your time. Thank you and uh, have, a, have a great day and enjoy the rest of your week. Oh, I see one last question. Maybe I'll answer it quickly. Uh, are quiet and static and, and very best ways isn't to whitelist. I would argue for Windows systems, the one of the best ways is to whitelist applications on or whatever politically correct term you wish to use. Um, oddly enough, uh, if you take some products that were doing application whitelisting, on the IT side, there was a lot of pushback and they didn't sell very well because IT environments are changing very often. If you're taking a, a historian or an HMI, they very rarely will change. And so no new software should ever be being installed on them. Uh, technician laptops are often your biggest risk inside of an organization or maybe even some of the jump boxes. Well, the jump box is also obviously, of course, but uh, the systems that have the most churn are probably the ones you want to lock down the most. Uh, in terms of priority. So, so there is some different aspects there. So I'll, I'll end it on that note. Um, ransomware is not a dumpster fire that you need to, you know, you sell your kidneys and, and hope to recover from. This is, uh, it is very doable. And if you look at it pragmatically and you add in for pre uh, preventative controls and control your, your own situation, uh, it won't be so bad, uh, even at a large scale, if you manage all of the pieces accordingly. So again, thank you very much for joining us and uh, have a great day.